And then, having done that, I'm going to begin us. Um, welcome to Going the Distance. My name is William, for those who haven't joined us before. And this is the first, the fourth meeting of our group. And uh, these Mondays are a faculty-led or instructor-led, staff-led discussion of larger ideas about online and remote teaching. We follow them on Wednesdays and Thursdays with tutorial sessions. And then on, then on Friday, we round out the week with what we call Tech Fridays at 1130 at the same address, uh, which is a themed discussion of the technical affordances of Canvas or Zoom or various grading and assessment um, tools. So my overall sense for these Monday discussions is that we need to see where we are as a moment of possibility. All teaching has constraints, whether that is in the classroom or whether it is in a Zoom room. Facing that, we realize that all teaching's constraints are ultimately an opportunity for innovation and for reflection on our practice. When I thought about this, this cadence of meetings, the first person really that I thought of as someone who truly sees the opportunities in a change of circumstance is Bob McLeod, who joins us today. Bob is the Richard and Joy Dorf Professor of Electrical Computer and Energy Engineering, and he's the director of the Material Science and Engineering Program, which he has championed. Bob is a PhD from CU Boulder. I didn't know that. But he worked in industry for many years before returning in 2003 as an assistant professor. I am always reminded of that experience that Bob comes, to a, comes back to us from industry. I'm reminded of it because of his tremendous sense of innovation and a kind of instantaneous can-do spirit. Bob was one of the first people to get on board with the MSEE and there was never an obstacle that, that Bob couldn't insurmount in one, in one gesture, one step, just say, well, you know, that's not an obstacle, we can move ahead. Why are we waiting over this? This sense of energy, I think, um, led Bob to partner with Amy Sullivan, who, who joins us today in the audience, uh, to make really one of the first three courses in the MSE and to launch it. Um, it was really one of the, the first leaders in the MSEE and really did a fabulous job with Amy of constructing that course and delivering it in a timely fashion with excellence. So, so I asked Bob um, to think about how he could talk about innovation in the lab. And I quoted him, um, I made the title about bringing a thousand students into, into the lab. And I realized that actually now that's a, a misquotation of something Bob said very early in the MSEE experience. The actual quotation is, you can't take 20 people into the lab, but you can take 10,000 not 1,000, you can take 10,000 people into the lab, right? So I missed the scale, you know, by a factor of 10. So ultimately, um, what I'm excited about here is both Bob, I wanna hear what Bob has to say about laboratory teaching and about, about the possibilities of innovating the lab. But more than that, I find in, in Bob a true spirit of, of innovation and um, enabling ability that oftentimes in the academy we get tied up in. We get tied up in traditions of practice. So I will stop, no further ado. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker, Bob McClellan. Thank you, William. I don't know if I can uh, follow up on the introduction. Um, I'm super excited that Amy is here as well. Uh, to, to give away a bit of my theme, uh, it's really that teaching is 
uh, in the future, I think, is, is a team experience. I, I think we have to give up teaching as an individual experience. Uh, and uh, Amy's been just my partner in crime uh, in, in getting to where we are now. I learned most of what I know from her. So um, William gave me a little uh, room there to, to expand on the, on the topic, uh, but I will get back to it. Um, and uh, I think we all understand that um, these Zoom platforms make it harder to have interaction. So I, I invite interruption, and if the conversation goes off the rails, that's exactly what we're here for. So I have some thoughts, but uh, let's, let's take the conversation wherever we want. I have a couple images to show, but most of the time I won't uh, do a PowerPoint because God who wants to see that Monday morning. So the, the topic William introduced is one that's been on my mind, probably all of our minds over the last few months as we try to figure out how to reinvent academia in the next, God, what is it, seven weeks. Um, and you know, I think we face an existential level crisis right now. Uh, between the pandemic, between the, the exposure of systematic racism, between economic challenges, um, universities are not going to make it. This is an evolutionary challenge, and uh, we, we have to figure out how to deliver our core mission in a new way. Um, the tricky bit there, uh, for me at least, and this is maybe from my business background, is I actually decided I didn't know what our core mission was. I, I couldn't elucidate it in a succinct actionable way. And so this has led me over the last months to sort of a Cartesian reduction of trying to figure out how to boil 20 years as a faculty member down to what is it we do again and why? Because I think, I think we need that if we're going to keep the good bits and, and put them in a new format. Um, so I actually, since I've learned from people like Amy that if you want to interact in discussion, uh, queue up some interactivity soon. I, I'm actually curious what you think our core mission is, and I'm gonna ask, and maybe that's our first discussion. But to load that up, I wanna tell you what a business person would answer, because it turns out uh, they're very good at this. Um, they've been doing it for years. Um, and uh, what I mean in particular here is the speech. Um, if, uh, if you go to Silicon Valley, Santa Clara, and you stop uh, 10 people on the street and ask them about the speech, seven of them will be able to give it. It's the Lord's Prayer of Silicon Valley. Uh, every person that's been in the startup business has heard exactly the same pitch. I've given it a couple times. Um, and uh, that's useful. They all know what they're, they're supposed to do. Supposedly, every decision they make is motivated by a common understanding of what the organization's goals are. And I didn't realize how much I would miss that until I got to academia and found that every single meeting I was in, the first half of it was everyone arguing over what the goal of the meeting was. Um, and you know, in diversity is strength. But I think right now we'd, we'd have some benefit if we could at least occasionally agree uh, what were the core pits that we were trying to, to exercise. And I don't know about you, but I find in a group of, of N faculty and staff, there are at least N squared um, goals, ideas, outcomes that people think would be you know, the right thing to do. Um, I hate sitting at a departmental prelim committee because the first three meetings are arguing about what is the prelim for exactly? And that's good, but also sometimes you wish you could just get to picking a date. Um, so um, the reason everyone knows the speech um, is uh, it's given to, to every startup business in the Valley. Um, and uh, the story goes like this. Uh, William and I are having a beer together. And after several beers, uh, it occurs to us that what the world needs is laser toasters. Um, and this, this is going to be the best thing ever, right? I mean, you could avoid the raisins. It would just be awesome. Um, so he hawks his bike and I hawk my roadster and we move into his garage and we start building laser toasters. And oh, it's fantastic. And then after both our credit cards and spousal patent patience begins to run out, it occurs to us we're gonna need a lot of resources, measured in dollars, uh, to manufacturing, to do distribution, to do you know, uh, customer service. It's just gonna take so much money to get this done. So we package up what we have in a slide deck, the pitch, and we head to Sand Hill Road, which is where all the money lives in Silicon Valley. Um, and we start presenting this to VCs and they give us, oh, $100 million for a 10% stake in the company. And they give us a CEO um, because we're not qualified to be that person. 
And a couple months later, we're sitting in a really shiny break room with a line of espresso machines that would make a barista jealous. And the CEO, she gives us the speech. And she tells us that we have gathered the best team of toaster engineers that has, you know, has been on this planet since Adam graduated from high school. And we are going to revolutionize breakfast. But we are not a toaster company. The moment we took investment, she will tell us, and I've heard this speech uh, from, from a former VP of, of IBM. She was she an was a, a exciting lady to work for. We now have only one mission, and that's to increase shareholder value. That's the phrase that you will, you will find written on every corner in Silicon Valley. And if day after tomorrow, that means Pop-Tarts are a better market than toasters, we will do that because our job is to increase shareholder value, full stop. So my, the good part of that is that everybody understands that's the job. The bad part is, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil, and a lot of the evils of Silicon Valley derive from that very phrase. I'm just curious if other people, I have a phrase that's very like that, but I'm just curious if other people have that succinct a summary of what our mission is in academia, because I, I think it's important for us to elucidate it. And we could do a fancy poll, but there's a small enough number of us that we can probably just talk. Or everyone can chat out what they think. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll jump in. I, I think that our silence says that no, there is no speech, <laughs> and that this would be something that we would all um, begin to discuss. My own thought is that our job is to increase the self-reflection on the given state of knowledge, and that's what I. Okay, it's nice that, that it has to be about self-reflection because it is not simply about memorization of the given state of knowledge it and memorization or um would be a static state of knowledge it has to be some kind of self-reflection that our goal maybe if i can um increase shareholder value <laughs> yeah increase increase self-reflection on the state of knowledge so i'll throw that out sheepishly uh, realizing that i, I like corrected immediately so I, um, my name is Leland, and I know some of you, but not everybody. Um, and I teach uh, in the Herps program, formerly known as the program of Humanities, now known as the Herps program for Engineering Ethics and Society. And we spent a lot of time talking about this because in renaming the program, uh, you have to, yeah, as you know, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't so long ago. Um, anyway, I think that we folks in our program would say that what we're doing is trying to make students, uh, engineering students, aware of their um, ethical responsibilities, both to themselves and to the um, engineering community, and to the shouldn't have used both to themselves, to the engineering community, and to their to the human race. So, but I realize that not every you know, like if you're teaching calculus, that maybe is not a relevant. Goal. Anybody else? My own, perhaps inspired by the, the three word one from the, the speech is simply inspire student success. I like inspire and I think student success is a good foundational word uh, or phrase. Um, and I am going to wind back to, to the topic that uh, William gave me, but, but maybe from maybe a good foundation. Um, to me, that the reason I like that phrase is uh, it explodes the myth that research and teaching are in conflict because graduate students are inspired to success by their research. That's, that's where they get it. It's just a different kind of teaching. Um, and William mentioned I have a, a lot of background in big companies, and national labs, et cetera. And, um, it turns out uh, that academia is arguably the absolute worst place to do research. You couldn't pick a worse one, arguably. And the reason is, is we chose to have trainees do the research. 
when you're in a national lab or even a VC funded startup, if you need a mechanical design done, you can go to the best mechanical engineer in the world and you get it done uh, instantaneously. I once had an optical engineer working for me um, who presented a result at our 8 a.m. all hands meeting and it was using a laser we didn't have. And I said, but we don't own that laser. And being a good Russian, he says, so I built one overnight. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, graduate students rarely have that level of skill. Um, and if you look in industry, uh, there have been these camelots of research, Bell Labs, uh, the Palo Alto Research Center, Google X, that gave us things like the transistor. I mean, they've been pretty darn successful. Um, but they tend to only last decades. Uh, and the reason is, I think their core mission, increase shareholder value, and do curiosity-driven fundamental research are pretty opposed. I don't think they go together very well. And so I think we, by choosing successive students, reflection upon themselves and the material, uh, learning their place in society, I think we build a place where research and that core mission go together better. And I'm finally getting to my big point here, hopefully. Um, and because of that, apparently, uh, we've lasted centuries where they last decades. But I actually think that doesn't explain it. I don't think it's enough. Um, and the more I have thought in the last few months about what really is our, our core strategy to satisfying our mission, I think it's bringing people together. I think that's what we do as a university. Uh, and uh, that's, um, you know, we've been doing that for a thousand years. Uh, you looked up University of Bologna founded in 1088. So we should all celebrate in 2088 that it's been a thousand years. Um, we bring together communities of learners. That's, that's the expectation of what a university is. If you want to learn Chaucer, you know to go to William. That's, that's what you should do. And if when you have N people in a room, you get N squared ideas, it's good to have communities, right? We know that. That's what makes the research or the teaching fun is and, and profitable and, 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 and responsive is there's so many people in the room with so many ideas and that's that bubbling of, of different people is, is what, what makes it all work. Um, and I think uh, the, the bringing pick, pick people together um, uh, to me is what we need to focus on in this in this coming change that we're facing. I think uh, I think there's some challenges there um, because I think one of the reasons people know to come to the ivory tower on the hill is that we don't change, that we've always been there, we've been about the same. That's why maybe we've lasted a thousand years. Uh, there's an expectation that William's there and he's still teaching Chaucer. Um, and yet, to deal with the persistent racism, we need to change. We need to change fast. To reinvent the university in the next seven weeks, we have to really be agile. And I think there's the yin-yang conflict that, that we face, is that we have to somehow maintain this expectation that people have that this is the place to come. This is where you find like-minded people you want to explore with. Um, and at the same time, uh, we have to turn on a dime uh, now. Um, and I think the real challenge for me, but I think also opportunity, and this is maybe yeah, my, my Silicon Valley attitude, is how do you bring people together when the first word in the sentence is remote, which is now have everything is, is done now. Uh, sorry, the, the daily planes are going over and I can't stand not to be outside during the summer. Um, so I, I have a couple little stories that I think illustrate for me where we are now, which I think is not a good place. And then I'll wrap up, because I think I want to leave lots of time for discussion, with sort of the exciting things I see happening over this remote, in big air quotes, uh, channel that I think actually can be advantageous. I think they can improve how we bring people together. So my story number one, subtitled The Graduate Student Teaching Experience, is when I came back to the university, I uh, was asked what course I wanted to teach. And I'd taken a course in optical system design, how you design lenses and telescopes and stuff, gotten into industry and found out I didn't know the topic. Um, the course hadn't been very good. So I wanted to teach that. So they said, yes, you have that. So I created and eventually delivered that course. 
I created the syllabus, I picked a textbook, I made the notes, I did the homeworks, I didn't ask anyone for help. Which was both stupid, but also expected. Um, no one thought that was weird, right? It, you're, you're a professor, you just go do it. Um, and if I had asked, then because I was new guy and pre-tenure, uh, people would have gotten, eh, okay. Um, I would have been thought a little weak, you know, for asking for help, but okay. If I did that now, I would be thought moderately weak, and it would be a little of an imposition because we treat teaching like research as an act of individual scholarship. And I think that's a really big mistake. Um, in this case, the course is part of our core exam that our, our, um, our prelim exam that our graduate students take to get into the PhD program. So it's actually particularly rude uh, of me to go off and develop it on my own. Um, I mean, what hubris to think that I somehow had the right to do that. Um, after a few years of teaching that, and now I'm you know, certified to not be too dangerous so I can be let into a room with undergrads, our chair, Mike Leitner, at the time, was having trouble getting all the courses assigned. So he took a big poll of all the faculty, what can you teach, what do you want to teach? And I ended up teaching our freshman introductory introduction to electronics course, which I was qualified to teach because I'd once taken a similar course. I mean, very, very different from what I do, but eh, I'm a professor, I'll figure it out. It turned out that the person that had been teaching the course for five years was an adjunct who lost his job because I was assigned the course. And he was pissed. So he took down the website, he removed the Canvas course, he left town, and he never answered another email. So I had nothing. I had zero information on what this course was about. Previous professor, uh, Peter Mathis, great guy, said, oh, well, yeah, I've got some notes, but uh, they're pretty old and they're all handwritten and it's all changed since then. So he didn't have anything. I eventually found a student that would share their notes with me, and that's what I had. And I didn't think to go to the chair of the department to say, whoa, this is a disaster. This is the entry level course to the program. It's where we prepare students for, for the rest of the program. It's where we sort of give them the essential skills they need. It's super important. And all I know is the title. But I didn't. I just made it up and I taught it. <laughs> and that was probably not real wise. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious, again, another, another interactive bit. In your own departments, particularly the undergrad level, the grad's kind of weird. Is this an experience that's never, occasionally, always? Do you step into machines? I know Amy is taught in the uh, physics department where it's got to be a machine. And for good or ill, there's the machine. And you step in and you don't have to invent everything. What's other people's, or Amy's, what's, what's your experience with teaching the curriculum being a team effort of the faculty? Well, I'm in the applied math department and um, I have never had to step into a machine, but I know we have several large machines for okay. Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, and differential equations. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know what people's experience in there is, but it's definitely uh, something that happens in our department. So I, I tend to teach uh, small courses that are based around my research, which is definitely not a machine. So in, in my case, um, because my area, I, I'm an instructor, but my area of expertise is niche, right? It's lighting, it's architectural lighting. So there's, there's no machine behind that except actually tradition. Um, the lighting program has been known at the University of Colorado for several years by uh, David Delora. He, um, well-known uh, person from industry and so the that has been the machine in a way is just just trying to carry that tradition and as, as best as we could you know it's interesting Bob and I find everything you say really provocative um, 
I've stepped into a number of in uh, freshman level courses and willfully reinvented them according to my own desires. Um, and in fact, it was Chris Haynes's discussion uh, two Mondays ago where Chris uh, presented the notion that, that university level instruction is often defined as idiosyncratic according to the professor. That, you know, in this course you will be studying with Professor McLeod, right? You will be learning at his feet, or Dr. Cuskin will deliver the Middle Ages. And, and you know, the notion is that the machine, yes, it is a machine, but it is entirely tailored to this idiosyncratic sense. Um, and I wonder, so as you're talking, I'm realizing how I, how invested I am in that. And I want to hear you talk through the tension between idiosyncrasy, which I think is a wonderful thing. On the other hand, you're obviously, you're, you're, your insight that we have to be communal in our construction of knowledge and in our continuation of tradition is, is true. How do we balance this tension? Yep. So I, I'll actually jump in here because I've, I've also spent several years teaching at a small liberal arts college where there were four members of the physics faculty and um, and they, um, they hired me mostly because I didn't have an experimentalist and they wanted me to develop upper level very specific optics courses, experimental physics courses. And so the other three members of the department didn't really have a expertise in that. And this is undergraduate level, so it's a, you know, a little different. Um, but it was still communal. It was still, we still had conversations where I said, hey, you know, these are the objectives I want to do. Here are, the, here are my learning objectives. Here are my goals. Here's the types of things I want to do. And they didn't, they didn't need to have subject expertise to have a fun discussion about, oh, hey, I've done something like this in my class, or I wonder if you'd like to try this, or, oh, you know, there's a professor in biology who does this thing that you'd really like to talk to. Um, and so um, I actually, I, I think that the machine actually worked quite well in physics when there's 600 students and I'm a farming monkey at best. Um, and it was, it, was, it was nice in a lot of ways and it's, they, they keep the quality of the education actually by having a machine and having everyone do the same thing. Um, but I think even in the, the upper level classes, it's, um, I think there's room for collaboration, just like there is in research. You don't have to be doing exactly the same research to be collaborating with somebody. Um, and I, I'm one of the people who works really, really well in collaborations and in a silo, I'm much less motivated. And I wonder how many other people would be much more motivated by those sorts of conversations. And clearly I'm setting up a straw man here, but uh, I think particularly as we move forward in this new and challenging environment, bringing together communities of teachers is just as important as beginning to, to, to gather communities of learners in, in these new environments. And really the reason is, is it the online experience is too big a job. Uh, I, that, that to me was, was one of the, the main things we learned about Coursera uh, when we did that. Uh, Amy and I teamed up just to deliver a single course and it was that same optical design course that I taught my very first year and we're still not quite done with the darn thing. Um, there's always something to fix and a, you know, a new thing to do. Um, so it's just an enormous job. And I, I only had two things I wanted to show. Uh, so I'm gonna see if I can share screen here. And this is one of them. And you see that, that uh, group of us, there's Amy and William and I, I'm there somewhere. Um, that was from the launch party of the, the, the online Masters of Engineering uh, degree for electrical engineering for, for Coursera. And the point is, there's five or six people there that are content creators, what used to be known as professors. Everyone else there is the folks that helped it all go. And it's an enormous lift is the point. I, nobody, had, I don't think any of us had any idea how big a lift it was. Um, the registrar is there and God, they had so much to do. There's a person over at the right I met over a glass of wine who created the online form 
which you use to register for the degree, which I would have thought, I don't know, go into Google Sheets and just make it or make Google Forms and make a form. She was on her fifth uh, testing session where she'd recruited people from the internet to try this out and test it. And I have now heard multiple times, one quite recently, that this, this portal into the degree is this thing of beauty. It is just so great. I have no idea um, that we needed that. So, you know, when we go to do research now, if I need a telescope, unlike Galileo, I don't build my own, right? If I need a computer, unlike Babbage, I don't build my own. We all understand that we need to, to work in these enormous communities to draw all these expertise. But I think a lot of us, the idiosyncratic you come to learn from a particular professor, still mainly have a mindset that the teaching is, is something you do all by yourself. And I think like, one of my key messages is in the online space, in this remote space, it's really hard to do that. It is just such a big job to take advantage of, to exploit uh, all of the potential, which I think we have to do. You, you really need a village, I think is, is one of the big messages to do it well. Um, which gets to uh, the, the, I even wrote down a thousand people in my notes, uh, William, so uh, your, your, your quote became cyclic, uh, the misquote. Um, I wanted to show a little bit of one of the videos that Amy put together because in our course, uh, we kind of subdivide a little bit and optics, uh, you know, laser labs, great big floating optical tables, laser goggles, you can bring two or three people into that dark room and they can cluster around the table and they can look at stuff, but you don't typically bring a class into that space because you can't bring 30 of them into that lab. It, it just doesn't work. It's not safe. You don't have enough goggles. But Amy realized that with good filming, you could make extremely intimate close-up experiences that you can bring in as many people in as fit on a Zoom browser or, or in the case of Coursera that they can serve. And so, ah, awesome. Uh, and I think I'm gonna jump back a little bit. Um, so just play a little bit of this. What we get is we get this rainbow effect in both directions so that we get a, a rainbow at the focus. I can't see it, Bob. Let's zoom in here. You can't see the screen? I'm sharing, sharing the wrong screen. So Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare that screen because maybe that was the problem because I don't want to miss that. It was so cool. Uh, well done, Amy. Maybe this I thought one. that was simply my lack of- uh, Does that look better? Ah, very okay. good. Okay. What we get is we get this rainbow effect in both directions so that we get a, a rainbow at the focus. Let's zoom in here just a little bit. We can see this focus, we can see that the blue beams are crossing closer to the lens and the red are crossing farther away from the lens, the yellow in the middle. And so we have what we call a chromatic aberration. This is where the different colors of light do not focus in the same places. Um, and, and now you just learned something about lenses. They tend to focus light at different distances. Um, so she did a lot of, and Amy, jump in if you want. There's a lot of not so obvious uh, content there. Notice the sound quality is really good. That's kind of important. The video quality is good, and that's hard. She spent a lot of time on that. Um, and um, if I'd run this right out of Coursera, there'd be little marks across the bottom, and it would stop occasionally and say, oh, all right, now you know about prisms. Think about the lens as a prism why does the blue light focus closer to the lens and the red light farther away? The answer, if you care, is Pink Floyd. Um, that's a cultural reference there, sorry. <laughs> um, but notice the scale of this. She, her fingers were too big. She had to use a pen to point. That's how close uh, you can bring everybody. So this is one of the things we learned in Coursera is, is you can create is interactive, it's not just a YouTube video. And there's active learning, you can send the students off to answer a question or think about something. Um, and extremely intimate experiences, which is a word that seems counterintuitive in this remote environment. So, I guess I can stop sharing, even though I just love that image. Um, where we're going from here, um, that was asynchronous. 
the whole point of the Coursera program was to scale up to thousands and thousands of students that were taking the course at their own pace and all asynchronous. But now we're going to take that knowledge and we're going to apply it to a four, my, my, my uh, 100 person freshman lab class this fall. So the idea is to do the same thing, but now synchronously. Um, the idea is there's no such thing as a demo anymore. That, that, that word's gone. And there aren't even traditional labs. Um, we have, um, this has been an enormous effort. Lots and lots of people, Keith Graham, our, our associate chair for education has, has led all this. So we can't bring the students into the lab because it was already too tight and the air was already too bad. So we've gotten industrial donors to uh, provide a pretty large pile of money. And we are buying for each of the students a little instrument that will plug into their computers that gets them the laboratory equipment, oscilloscopes, power supplies, meters. And so they each have, okay, version of lab equipment at home. We also have instructional, instructional donors, uh, sorry, don donors, industrial donors, um, that are buying for the students uh, a little processor that has a little screen on it and buttons. It's sort of all of the lab kit, all of the, all of a good portion of what they need to program and lights to go off, et cetera. And a stand for their cell phone. And that part seems weird, but just like you saw in Amy's video where you're looking right at that light, the instructional staff and the students need the ability to create that same view. So what's gonna happen in this class is they're gonna walk in and we're gonna say, hey, welcome to the project-based freshman engineering class, pick a project. And they're not gonna have any idea what those are. So some of them are gonna say, and we're gonna have like 10 or 20 that they can pick from. And one of them's gonna pick, two of them or three of them, they'll be in groups. I like the lightsaber that is, you know, when I move it, it makes a noise and it lights up when I push a button and then it, you know, makes a different noise when I push a different button. Tiny little toy engineering project, but they don't know how to do any of that. So they're going to then need to know how to hook an LED up to a battery to light it up. There will be an online forum for that, which we'll do live they will be looking at my circuit board and it will be, you know, it will fill the screen. Maybe a side by side, maybe there'll be code if I'm driving it from the computer and I will be looking at theirs. I will see their setup, which will be identical. And I'll say, okay, let's hook the diode up here. And three out of four of them will do it backwards because that's what they do. Um, and so those, the light won't go off. And I'll say, okay, now, everyone whose light didn't go off, you go to that breakout room, breakout room. Everyone who doesn't know how to write the code, the four lines, you go to that breakout room, and there will be TAs waiting there, and they will work them through that problem, and five minutes later, they'll all come back. So the idea is this very intimate, again, up close, they can see what I'm doing, we can see what they're doing, experience where instead of in the laboratory where I give them a paper write-up, these are gone, there's no more lab write-ups with you know, pages and pages of instructions. We all get together and we do it. And some of them have trouble. So we take them off to the side and we work them through the trouble and we bring them back. And at the end of that day, we've done that bit. And of course it's all recorded because some of them got sick or were stuck in China um, or you know, had a class conflict or something, and they can do it asynchronously. Not as good, but you know, it's still there. They can go back and replay the experience at slower speed. And we, we kind of, it, it's not flipped classroom anymore. It's very much like we can have instructional staff standing with all of them, all the time. And I think that even though remote has this character of bringing them together, of more of them being able to participate simultaneously than they could in the instructional lab. Now, that's a dream. We'll see if we can pull it off. We're working our asses off to make that happen. <laughs> can I say something about that? I think that's really great. Um, I hated being in labs. Um, I, I was something about the the lighting, the sound, everything just was wrong for me, and the remoteness from the instructor. What you've done here is is brilliant because you've made the instructor handy right there um, in your pocket, in your face, and I just I think it's wonderful. I don't know if other people had that same kind of 
visceral reaction to this, but it was just like, oh, this is going to be better than being in one of those giant labs with um, just very far away from the person who was trying to direct you. So I think that's great. So it turned, the other thing that has been exciting to me is we brought together a team to develop this. So it's not just bringing the students together. So normally there's an instructor, Ariel Blum, who teaches this in the off semesters. She's awesome, super engaged and passionate about teaching. Um, so we're gonna co-teach both semesters. So that just gives two of us instead of spreading us out. That's the only way we're gonna get the development done. Turns out while chatting, it turns out we're both gamers. She likes to fly spaceships around and shoot at lots of other people. I like to swing swords and go kill dragons with lots of other people. So we decided gamification. That's a common, it's a well-known uh, thing to do in education. So it turns out in the Canvas platform, you can create modules that are released when certain conditions are met. And you can create these whole trees and I think it look, looks like it. So our plan is, again, these students pick the lightsaber project and they need to know how to design um, the handle for a 3D printer and they've never done this. So they get the quest go off to this Canvas module and learn how to use this piece of software and design this thing or calculate this number. And when you do that, at the end of that little quest, that little five minute video with a focused goal, um, you're gonna get a, a quiz, a homework, a test. They're not really any of those things, but that's what they're replacing. That some problem that you need to solve that shows that you've mastered that. And you can do this in Coursera, Amy and I discovered this. You can also do it through Canvas and PlayPosit modules that are built in. Um, the student doesn't get it. And so they get some feedback that says, oh, you, you know, try, try, try thinking about this or maybe go look at this video. Um, and they keep doing it until they get it. And then they're done and that goes to the grade book and they go on to the next module, the next step in their quest. Um, and so that's how we're thinking of the asynchronous content, that it's not one size fits all, it's totally project driven. It's a lot of work to put it all together, we're panicking. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that, uh, again, personalizing it, bringing it to them in a way that satisfies what they need. And we found in the fall, I found, that uh, I used the stuff that uh, the, the, the Coursera course that Amy and I put together to teach that same graduate level course. And I saw those graduates immediately fall off the truck. They fell behind, they stopped working. Oh, I can catch up later. And I spent the whole semester trying to get them through the material before the end of the semester arrived. So we know we're gonna have trouble with people staying motivated. You know, freshman year is tough anyway in engineering. Um, so we're gonna run everything through Canvas with automatic grade uploads. And we're gonna write a tool, we got an undergrad working on this, to mine that date grade book and so we can find in a two to three day period, someone starting to fall behind. We can just see where everyone is. And when they get a week behind, again, using some game language, uh, raids in these massively online games, so where a bunch of gamers get together over the internet and they take on some ultra powerful quest, some boss, something they can't do by themselves. So if everyone or a group of people, not everyone, have fallen behind on the learn the CAD tool, quest, we schedule a raid and we all get together and we lead them through it. And at the end of it, they're through that because they got together and they did it as a group. Um, it's not remedial. It's not catch up. It's not nag. It's not you're penalized for being late on the homework. It's, hey, let's all go challenge this thing because apparently it's hard. Um, so, I mean, these are obviously dreams but we've got a team of six undergrads, myself and Ariel, we've got Keith in the department, and I have been alternately depressed and excited about the way our faculty have come together and done things that we've talked about for years, but just couldn't, we didn't have a crisis to motivate us. So I'm actually pretty excited about trying to learn how to make communities of teaching and learning through this remote platform. Um, and boy, we're gonna stub our toes a lot. Um, but I, I, think, uh, I think, like you said, Leland, I think it might be possible to make it better. 
And I, I think that's the goal we have to shoot for. Otherwise, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It's kind of depressing. Um, but that's the pitch I want to give these students on day one is, aren't you lucky you showed up on COVID year? <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's, that's the majority of what I had to share. I've got some other little details, but that's the big idea is it's such a big thing that I think it forces us to come together to do it well. But I think it's possible. Bob, I, I, I think I speak for everyone when I say that you've energized me, given me ideas, and I just love this. I also think I speak for everyone when I say I want to hear, before we open it up to, to a general conversation, I want to hear those other little ideas. Um, I don't want to leave a single um, crumb on the table here. All right. Just two. Um, I just, I, I made some random notes. Um, one, a um, bunch of the students Ariel found are from the TAM program, Technology, Arts, and Media. So they're engineering art sort of crossover. One of them looked and said, you know what, we need color schemes. To which I went, we need what? Um, so no, no, every course needs a color palette. And so when you're studying this course, you know you're studying that course because it's the sunset color palette. But when you're over here, it's, you know, it's some other color palette. Okay, I guess that's cool. Uh, and they said, then all of your materials, your, your, your backgrounds for your videos, your, if they're handouts, whatever, they're all in that color palette. Okay, it's professional, I guess. And then they said, and then I started to see where they were going, everything in the course is color coded with that palette. So when we present a block diagram of a circuit, there's power, and there's computing, and there's, I don't know, data, and storage, and there's wires between them, and they're all color-coded from the beginning. Every single diagram they see has got a common color scheme. So after about a week, they don't even think about it. They look at a circuit, and this is a big deal for young engineers, and they go, oh, I see what the pieces of that are, because they've been trained to that. A, I would not know how to do that. I would never take the time. It wouldn't have occurred to me to do it, right? So this is the team thing again, is people can, if, if there's enough space, people can bring these skills and passions and different experiences they have and, and build a better, better product or a better learning experience for the students. Um, that was cool. I was hoping to get one of those before, uh, before the meeting, but I forgot to ask for it till this morning. Um, and I guess the last thing, and this is just one of these sort of warms my heart that we're doing it. Um, we teach a bunch of lab courses. Students need bits. They need resistors and diodes and batteries and stuff. Um, and we don't have a budget for that, so they have to buy them. And, and that cost can be order $100 a course. And we always struggle to try to keep that down. And we've said for 20 years, we should organize across all the lab courses so that these kits fit together and you don't buy the same thing twice. Or if we choose a particular platform, the next class uses the next step in that platform. So we at least tell the students we honor their sacrifice of paying for these things and we just could never do it. And now there's one spreadsheet to rule them all. TM, that's the name. Um, and it's got everything they need and there's never a repeat all the way across. And we've argued about this and this splat and we finally got together and as a faculty, we've, we've outlined this is the hardware you're going to use through your whole degree and you're gonna buy a bit of it each class. Just stupid things that are of course obvious but we never had the crisis to drive us to do it. Yeah. So, great. Yeah, sometimes you're depressed but other times you look at that and go, oh, well that, that's good, we, we managed to make that happen, so. Great, great, that was wonderful. So I have a number of thoughts, but I, I wanna open it up and hear what other people think. Thank you, Bob, that was actually all very interesting. Um, I like your idea of collaborative, you know, collaboration um, in teaching. I think that would be very nice. But I think there is also this barrier initially so I don't know what the whether you knew Amy before you two joined on that Coursera course. You know what, right? So I think you know you, you can't just put any two people together, right? Um, and there's definitely an initial barrier if you don't know each other to start. Um, Aero the Aero department does joint teaching. I think all their sophomore level core courses are 
jointly taught. And I've talked with some of their faculty and they all say it can work well only if you partner with the right person, <laughs> right? I mean, there's personality differences and all of that. Um, and, and the aero department also incentivizes that uh, basically at this point, they're all jointly taught all the sophomore level courses, but they give the faculty each one teaching credit for jointly teaching that course. Um, and I don't, yeah, so I think there's some barriers to getting that sort of joint teaching into say ECE. Yep. Right? Um, what overcame the barrier for me was the crisis, right? It was, it was the only way I'm going to live through this coming year is if I, if I have a team to, to help me do it. So. Yeah. And, and you had, you had, so would, was Amy working in your lab already, or I don't know the, the background, but you, but you basically, you had someone you could ask for help, right? I mean, I think uh, that is not necessarily the case for, on, on the 1400, I didn't know Ariel before this, um, and it was just obvious that we we needed to work together to to create this new course. She approaches the course quite differently than I did, um, and so yeah, I'm going to have to bend a lot, and she probably will too. But but yeah, there's there's just there's just no way we're going to live through it unless we work together. So, and I can see there's a cohort in our department, you know, talking ECE um, here that of faculty who really and instructors who really care to teach well and i think pairing up with almost any one of those would be fine but there is a a group of faculty who unfortunately don't care how well they teach and i would never want to be paired with them um, right so the downsides of collaboration people yeah. <laughs> I think the people that teach really well probably are stronger on the idiosyncrasies, which can make it harder to to collaborate. Um, can I just, uh, I'm not completely sure if we're talking about team teaching, which is coordinated but separate, or co-teaching, which is playing off of each other. I feel like co-teaching is closer. Um, and again, I'm, I'm basing this on, I've got a huge challenge, 100 people, lab class, freshmen, need to build community, all sorts of things that are an enormous challenge now to deliver remotely. And so we had to reimagine the class. And at that point, it's not team teaching. Uh, it's, it's bringing together a team to develop not just a new course, but a new, a new delivery method, a new pedagogy. Yeah, I like it. At the beginning of your talk, I was hearing standardization, and I was kind of like, oh, <laughs> but uh, this is really interesting and exciting. Other thoughts? So if no one's going to jump in, um, I want to sum up, but before we get there, Bob, I want to ask you something about idiosyncrasy. Um, you strike me as just an incredibly unique presenter. And part of that uniqueness, I think, is um, has to do with a certain kind of candor that you're able to generate. And I wonder, this is really an oddball question, I guess. I wonder what frame of mind you generate before you walk into the classroom how you get into your lecture modality. What is it that you aspire to, to deliver a lecture? All right, that's a fun one. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear what other people say. Um, I think I've had to learn that over the years. I think that's one of the things I've learned a lot uh, about my own teaching um, is that, um, you need to go into the classroom as, to use the gamer technology, the noob, um, as the person who's completely fresh on this material. Um, and I, I, I got into just-in-time teaching for a while, uh, and I actually recommend that to a lot of new faculty. 
because I think over preparation is one of our biggest errors in teaching. And the thought is once you know the material as a master and you present it as a master, that's not what the students view they need. They need the, I just stubbed my toe on this. Oh, I see, I have to step over it. Oh, you know, oh God, that seems wrong. No, oh, here's why it's not. They, they need to hear the development of the thought from the perspective of someone who's not seen it before. And so I think it's fun to try to come into that lecture, whether it's freshman level or advanced grad, in their chair, right? And inspire and lead them through the material. Um, and again, I think that's, that's so if, uh, another professor I love in, in electrical engineering, and Lucy will know who I mean, um, prepares on the order of 2,000 pages of PowerPoints for teaching a particular class, and they are beautiful. I mean, they are amazing. They are three-dimensional graphics and everything latex up, et cetera. But that's the master's view. Right? If you want to know the material at the level of Newton himself, that's the thing. But most people don't start there and they need help getting there. And scribbles on a blackboard might be better than a nine dimensional color coded chart <laughs> for the same material. You know, we argue over that particular point. <laughs> the, the most renowned professor in the English department, he's retired. Um, but he is a professor. When I was chair of the English department, I would get notes from, from people who had so long graduated and they would be reflecting on their college experience and they would point time and time again to this one professor. Uh, and he was a professor of Chaucer. So as a teacher of Chaucer, I would often try and sit on, on his class and um, learn how to do this. And the thing I took away is that when he asked a question, even though I'd seen him ask the very same question before, his mindset was as a noob, as if asking this question about the partner in the general prologue was the first time he'd ever considered it. <laughs> though I'd seen him consider it before. And that connects to my mind about what you're saying about a freshness, a newness that, the, that one has to generate. I guess this is part of our structure we're thinking about. Um, in, in the same line of thought, uh, the traditional mode of teaching engineering or a lot of sciences is, oh, you need to build a foundation and then those lead to the next level and you have to have all those concepts right and then you can get the next level concepts. Well, it turns out nobody learns that way. We didn't learn that way, but we just remember that we learned that way because now we've built the pyramid. Right. So particularly in this freshman class, we might have them working on operational amplifiers and they might be a little still uncertain on what a resistor is. But if they can do it, that's okay. If they need that, they'll go get it and we'll make, try to make the material available for them. But we want them to jump in and try things and go, oh, well, that's funny, what does that do? And maybe I kind of can make this work, I'm good with that. Because actually that's part of the spirit we want to train them to as engineers of, oh, let's jump in. Let's see if we can figure it out. Uh, oh, I don't know something. I'll go learn that. That might be important, more important than building a framework. <laughs> in a word, it is the spirit of inquiry that you teach, not the jot and tittle of the content. And if the spirit of inquiry can lead them through the dungeon to victory, then, you know, whether they followed every dang process, you're satisfied. Yeah. So this has gone a very quick hour. And I want to just say what I found so tremendously um, energizing in this is that at the core of what you're saying, I see a fundamental tension. Um, and I saw that tension play out on a few points. And you opened, you know, talking about how the academy, um, in its confusion about its goals, nevertheless, is a tremendously resilient and, and continuing institution. And that, it seems to me, that sense of traditional stasis, if not confusion, versus an ability to change that it also jeopardizes uh, longevity 
That to me is a kind of tension that I saw played out between a number of themes, team, idiosyncratic teaching, change, stasis, machine, intimacy. You played it out on a number of, of different levels. And it seemed to me that in the end, what I took was not some ultimate resolution. Oh, now we need to change to become different. So much as a sense of understanding that at the heart of it is a level of play that always makes the project um, engaging and exciting. And your metaphor of gamification of the quest, I think was brilliant because the quest never ends, but it pulls together the fellowship and asks them to move forward together. Yeah. And that to me is just, it's a very exciting and dynamic way of resolving yet another tension, which is synchronicity versus asynchronicity. So I want to thank you for that, Bob. Uh, I found that, as I said, energizing, exciting, and, and really something to think about as we move forward. Thank you. And thank you to Amy for joining us. And um, I, I, you're a real partner in this whole process of thought around what makes a successful asynchronous course that can then be ported over into this new hybrid environment. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank um, you. I will post this and as I like to say, onwards. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.